welcome to another episode of A Catholic and a Protestant Walk Into a Bar. I'm Elijah, and I'm the Protestant. And I'm Nathaniel, and I'm a Catholic. Today we're going to be talking about homosexuality. What is the Christian position concerning homosexuality? Does God make people gay? Um, also, we're going to be discussing a situation about this question concerning uh, Pope Francis, the current uh, occupant of the chair of St. Peter. And also, we'll be talking about what the Bible says about homosexuality, um, as well as what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says about homosexuality. And then we're going to talk about papal infallibility. What is it? And just because the Pope says the sky is green and the grass blue, does it make it so? If you guys hear a lot of noise in the background, um, my house doesn't have any air conditioning, so that's just a ceiling fan. Um, if we didn't have that, we would be dead. Literally. We would die of heat stroke. Alright, so uh, earlier this week, or the week before, um, there was a, an issue that happened in Chile with an, a, a sexual abuse scandal. Alright, so yeah, um, in, in Chile, um, there has been an ongoing sexual abuse scandal and cover-up, and um, back in 2015, uh, Pope Francis appointed one bishop who had been known to have some problems in this area of cover-up or whatever. And there, it was kind of a scandal, but Pope Francis didn't uh, really give any mind. He just appointed the bishop anyway. And later on, um, the bishop um, res offered his resignation several times. Pope rejected it. Um, even earlier this year, the Pope got in hot water because the Pope was talking about how, you know, the victims of this abuse um, should not accuse this one certain bishop he had appointed because none of the evidence had come forward. Um, and then, you know, the press does its job and then it's shown that the victims had given a letter to Cardinal Sean O'Malley and Sean O'Malley said that this letter of their evidence uh, was given to the Pope. And so there was a big scandal. Yay. Um, again. Again. Yay. Um, but um, all this boiling down to that the Pope summoned all the Chilean bishops to Rome to basically give them a talk about um, just what's going on and the horribleness of the situation um, concerning sexual abuse. And a few days later, after he met with them, uh, the entire Chilean bishops conference uh, submitted their resignation to him. And while all of this is going on, you know, this big storm of bad stuff, really. Pope Francis meets with sexual abuse survivors, you know. I'm sure he apologized to them, so on and so forth. So forth, rather. But there was one, he met with Juan Carlos, who uh, basically um, was one of the whistleblowers concerning uh, the bishop that Pope Francis had appointed had been raped and abused by um, a priest, and so on and so forth. And Pope Francis met with him, and Juan Carlos purported that uh, Pope Francis said that, Juan Carlos, I don't care if you're gay. You know, God made you this way. I love you. God loves you, etc., etc. Um, and that's what Juan Carlos said, the Pope said. And so you get in the situation of he said, she said, whatever, and I think the most um, saddening aspect of this is that, you know, this has happened last week, um, and the Vatican has not come out to clarify, deny anything. It's just silence. Which seems to be a trend. Yeah. I mean, whether it's, you know, um, Cardinals Burke uh, and others, you know, submitting uh, a dubia, asking him to clarify things about his document, Amoris Laetitia, on marriage and the family, um, to, you know, the filial correction where laymen um, of various universities and um, vocational callings basically sign a document saying, hey, you need to look at these points of your official teaching because um, you may be purporting, you know, heresy, etc. And so there's, you know, logistical issues, whether governance of the actual church Catholic, whether um, doctrinal issues, official teaching issues. Pope Francis uh, has gotten himself in a lot of hot water on so many fronts that it's just hard to know where to begin. But in this issue, um, you know, uh, it's just another thing of, did the Pope actually say this? What did the Pope mean? Will he clarify it? 
And it looks right now that it'll just be another thing where Pope Francis chooses not to clarify anything, um, which can be discouraging. But the thing is, um, I don't think, like, this may be a hard time for the Catholic Church, but by no means should a Catholic lose their faith or um, despair because unless you know what the actual teaching of papal infallibility is, um, you know, um, you know that even a pope can't change public revelation, can't tra change the tradition of the Catholic Church, can't, definitely can't change scripture, etc., but that there are times where, you know, the humanity aspect of the papacy comes out and, you know, it's just part of it and learn your Catholic faith and, you know, move on and know that, no, Pope Francis isn't God. So, so you're saying that he can't, what he says or is alleged to have said doesn't become, you know, church doctrine it's not, just It's not magisterial it. teaching. Um, it is, does not, definitely does not fall um, under papal infallibility, um, which, you know, kinds of, you know, needs to be talked about. Because I think there are a lot of people out there, when they hear the word, or the phrase, rather, of papal infallibility, they think anything that the current pope says must be, like, revealed by God or is some new revelation. But the Catholic Church teaches that public revelation of what God had to say to man is already closed. Um, the public revelation is principally found in the scriptures and in the tradition of the church um, uh, to define, you know, yes, there are, you know, three persons in eternity. God is triune, etc., etc. No, you know, there is no fourth person in the Trinity. No, you know... You know, and these are found in the councils of the church and found, you know, in, you know, the ordinary magisterium of the church. And I know I'm throwing around a lot of doc, uh, I know I'm throwing around a lot of jargon here, but you should know that the magisterium comes from the word Latin, uh, the Latin word magister, which means teacher. So the magisterium is just the, the teaching capacity of the Catholic church. Um, and again, the Catholic Church teaches that public revelation is closed. It's closed with the last apostle, the Apostle John, dying. There is no more like public revelation that has to do with our salvation, etc., that you can know. So we can't subscribe to Mormonism, say, because Joseph Smith is not an apostle. Joseph Smith is in the 19th century, and mm -hmm. so on. So we're definitely a, a, a religion of revelation. Um, and so, for us, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome, and, you know, we subscribe to apostolic succession, which means that priests, deacons, bishops, cardinals, they all are part of a 2,000-year-old game of, uh, Jesus tag, of, um, <laughs> you know, basically God... Big, uh, big, long game of pass the baton. Yeah, of God just saying, okay, here's church. That doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean that they're immaculate. But it does mean that you know God does use men to impart His truth and to help spread the gospel. Um, but it's important to realize that you know the magisterium of the Catholic Church, um, according to paragraph um, eighty-six, that the Church recognizes that you know the popes, um, all the bishops in the communion with Rome. Um, all the bishops, the bishops that ever were. Um, in paragraph 86, it says, Yet this magisterium, again, that is the teaching capacity of the Catholic Church, is not superior to the Word of God, which means both the written scriptures and Jesus Christ himself, who is the Word of God, but its servant. So magisterium is not superior to the Word of God, but its servant. It teaches only what has ha been handed on to it at the divine command and with the help of the Holy Spirit. It listens to this devotedly, guards it with dedication, and expounds it faithfully. All that it proposes for its belief as being divinely revealed is drawn from the single deposit of faith. That deposit of faith, public revelation, um, which happened in the first century with the coming of Jesus Christ. Surprise. Um, <laughs> Shocker there. Shock. Um, but then when we come to, you know, okay, so the church has a teaching authority of the magisterium. Um, what does the pope have to do, do with anything with this? Um, and I guess I'm just going to draw from... I think about two paragraphs will be fine, but I think um, to understand what Catholics actually believe about the, the teaching office of the Pope um, and papal infallibility is important. Um, so I bear with me here, but 
Here is what we believe about papal infallibility. Uh, the mission of the magisterium, starting at paragraph 890, the mission of the magisterium is linked to the definitive nature of the covenant established by God with his people in Christ. It is this magisterium's task to preserve God's people from deviations and defections and to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the true faith without error. Thus, the pastoral duty of the magisterium is aimed at seeing to it that the people of God abides in the truth that liberates. To fulfill this service, Christ endowed the church's shepherds with a charism of infallibility in the matters of faith and morals. The exercise of this charism takes several forms. And then this is where we come to papal infallibility. So paragraph 891. The Roman pontiff, that is the, head, the pope, head of the College of Bishops, enjoys this infallibility in virtue of his office when, as supreme pastor and teacher of all the faithful, who confirms his brethren in the faith, he proclaims by a definitive act a doctrine pertaining to faith or morals. The infallibility promised to the church is also present in the body of bishops when, together with Peter's successor, they exercise the supreme magisterium, above all, in an ecumenical council. So think like the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Chalcedon. Um, when the church, through its supreme magisterium, proposes a doctrine for belief as being divinely revealed, and as the teaching of Christ, the definitions must be adhered to with the obedience of faith. This infallibility extends as far as the deposit of divine re revelation itself. That's public revelation. And then, yeah, um, basically the following paragraph just says divine assistance is also given to the successors of the apostles, that is, you know, the popes and the bishops, um, teaching a communion with the successor of Peter and in a particular way to the bishop of Rome, pastor of the whole church, when arri without arriving at an infallible definition, without pronouncing in a definitive manner, they propose in the exercise of the ordinary magisterium a teaching that leads to a better understanding of revelation in matters of faith and morals. So, I mean, you see this in, again, you know, defining the doctrine of the Trinity, using the word incarnation, you know, you know, the creed, especially the Nicene Creed, you know, hashing that out at the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. Um, you know, these bishops just basically hash it out and have to fight it out. It's, there's no other way. And in some cases, like with uh, St. Nicholas and Arius, literally, you know, fighting it out. Yeah, I mean, some people say that story is apocryphal, but I hope to God not. I want St. Nicholas to punch Arius. I'm sorry if that's too politically incorrect, but, you know, sometimes you have to just fight for the truth. I would love it if St. Nicholas actually turned out to be a fat, jolly man who punches Arius in the face and then walks away laughing and gives a toy to a little kid. I don't know. You know, yeah, Father Christmas. There yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, as a, as a Protestant, I don't really... What the Pope says doesn't affect me all that much, personally. Um, he could say that the Bible is false, I don't know, and I wouldn't care because it, it doesn't affect me as a Protestant. However, um, the way that it does kind of affect me is the way in which the world sees the church. Because the Pope, regardless of whether or not I, I think of him as the supreme pontiff of the church, he is the figurehead of, of the way the world sees the church whether you're Catholic or Protestant. So we kind of have to watch and see and, and uh, analyze what it is he says. And we need to be able to parse what he says accurately. So that's why, you know, having Nathaniel say everything that you said about and, and going through the magisterium and the, and the catechism to be able to understand whether or not he has that authority is important. Or otherwise people can say, oh, well, the Pope said this and he's the figurehead of the church so we can do all these things instead of actually knowing the, the role that the Pope actually has. I think, again, we have to think, okay, so Juan Carlos said this is what the Pope said. And if he said, if the Pope did indeed say it, then yes, it is wrong. Um, but is it Catholic teaching? No, because the Pope did not say, I, Pope Francis, urge all the faithful, and I speak ex cathedra, which is a very important term. Ex cathedra is how the Pope exercises his infallibility. It means from the seat of Peter, because the Pope sits in St. Peter's chair as, you know, his, the vicar of Christ and the vicar of St. Peter. So unless the Pope see, speaks something ex cathedra, um, it's not official doctrine. Um, now what the Pope does, and like when he preaches, when he teaches, when he does something, Catholics are always supposed to show assent, uh, which is to say, we're always supposed to listen to our Pope. I mean, he's our dad. He's, that's what the word Pope means. He's daddy. He's papa. But the thing is, the Pope isn't God. So 
um, he has to be a defender of the faith handed on to him. He can't just innovate. And if he does innovate, then he has to return to the tradition of the church. Um, and you see this down in history with uh, popes like Pope Honor Honorius, who was, you know, dealing with some Arian quibblings and, you know, the subsequent heresies of monothelitism or monophysitism, a bunch of jargon. But anyways, he had some quibblings with Arianism, and he wasn't quite um, harsh on it, and he didn't really say much. He was vague. Um, and 40 years later, he got anathematized, so that was fun. And then, you know, you have popes like Pope John the Twenty Second in the Middle Ages uh, who taught soul sleep, which is to say once the person dies, they don't see the beatific vision until the final resurrection. Whereas, mm. you know, orthodoxy beforehand had said, well, no, when somebody dies, they see Jesus. There's a private judgment before the public judgment. Mm -hmm. And so you see times in church history where the current occupant of the papacy... Um, isn't up to snuff sometimes. Um, and that's okay, because there's a human aspect to the papacy. Um, but Pope Francis didn't speak ex cathedra about this, and the Pope can have an errant opinion about something. It's when the Pope makes it an official teaching of the Church, when, you know, you should probably be getting concerned, and, you know, when the, you know, if there were a council that all of a sudden, an ecumenical council of the Church has said, you know, gay, okay, do whatever you want, whatever feels good, then yes, that's when we should be concerned. But um, I think if what the Pope said is true, um, then we have to look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the tradition of the Church. Just a quick aside before we actually go into everything about uh, homosexuality, same-sex attraction, what the uh, Catholic Church teaches, what... Um, the Bible says, which is what you know, Protestants would would say is is a Protestant teaching. Um, full disclosure: my younger brother is uh, a homosexual, uh, active, actively homosexual. Um, he is not. He's not a believer, either. Um, so I'm not coming at this subject without any knowledge or any any connection with people that are homosexuals, and and neither is. No, neither are you, Nathaniel. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not coming at this because we hate gays or we hate homosexuals. And my, my little brother and I are incredibly close. We talk all the time or as often as we can. He knows what I believe and I know what he thinks. We respect each other as people, but we have to disagree on, on the morality of, of the actions. Anyway, just wanted to say get that in there before we launch our discussion. <laughs> so now that we've gone over, you know, why we're talking about this subject today, um, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does it say about, or what does the catechism say about homosexuality? Does what the Pope said actually even stand up to Catholic teaching? So, the Catechism says this about homosexuality. But first, you know, the Catechism has a section about, you know, rightly ordered sexuality and talks about the need for all people to practice chastity. This includes single people and married people. Chastity, which is giving your sexual faculties to God and using him to the good created ends that God intended them for. So, when it comes to homosexuality, um, the Church recognizes that this has been a thing in human history, and especially in our modern times, this has been part of the human experience, which is to say there have been, you know, according to paragraph 2358, the number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible, which is we know that they're there. We know that people have same-sex attraction. Um, but, you know, you even go to par the preceding paragraph, um, the tradition of the church is basically saying, basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as an act of grave depravity, tradition, the tradition of the church has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They're contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They not proceed from a genuine effective and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. So we can't approve the actual act of homosexual sex. Mm -hmm. It 
is not procreative. It does not. It doesn't fulfill the the purpose of sexual of, of sex. It, it it God created it for babies and to unite husband and wife, a man and woman. Um, however, returning to two twenty three fifty eight here, um, speaking of homosexual persons, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church says in its teaching, homosexual persons they must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Don't go pulling a Westboro Baptist Church and saying God hates you know what. God hates um, uh, cigarette butts. Yes, yes. Don't go do and say that. The catechism says they must be accepted and respected and shown compassion and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives, and if they are Christians, to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross and the difficulties they may encounter from their condition. Because everybody's tempted with whatever sexual sin it is. But yeah. the, the idea is you respond to God's grace, you cooperate, and you avoid sinning. Exactly. Wow. And then just finally in paragraph 2359, homosexual persons, like married persons and single heterosexual persons, are called to chastity by the virtue, virtues of self-mastery that teach them their inner freedom, at times by the support of disinterested friendship, by prayer and sacramental grace, that means going to church, y'all, um, they can and should gradually, resolutely approach Christian perfection. That means almost, that means Christian holiness is available to those experiencing same-sex attraction. Does that mean that those people who are um, same-sex attracted should be having sex? No, because it's a sin. But that doesn't mean we should, you know, recognize that I have these tendencies, but I will still serve God with them and obey His law and and the promptings of grace, which tell me to be chaste and not to follow those inclinations and yes pr practice abstinence and not have sex outside a sacramental marriage between a man and a woman right now that we know what the catechism says and you know what the pope allegedly said isn't you know all that um isn't binding um what does the bible say well obviously there are the levitical passages in the uh, in the torah and the pentateuch where it talks about homosexuality and talks about how it's disordered and an abomination. But even if you ignore those passages and say, oh, well, the, that part of the Old Testament doesn't apply, which it actually, the Old Testament is still beneficial for us today, and that's a subject for another podcast. Um, the New Testament is rife with talking about homosexuality and, and all kinds of sins. Actually, it lumps them in with all sorts of things. The, the, the Bible doesn't single out homosexuality the way, unfortunately, we have in our modern our modern day um it puts it in with adultery fornication and all kinds of other sins like gluttony and greed and uh disobeying parents or being disrespectful and dishonoring of parents the infamous romans 1 passages talks about you know god allowing people to just follow and their and give into their their lusts and giving into the lust doesn't mean that the that the the temptation or the the sentimentality is is intrinsically disordered. It's the the acting. It's the giving into the lust that's the problem. And um, in the in the famous list of sins in First Corinthians six nine through eleven, it says, "Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God." And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. This is putting homosexuality at the same level as drunkenness or drunkards and being a swindler. It's not just singling out homosexuality as the worst sin ever, but it is pointing out that any that people who are actively living homosexual lifestyles are showing that they're not sons of God. As it says at the very end, such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, and you justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. That means that when when Christ comes into us, he, he doesn't necessarily take away the desires or take away attractions or or feelings or, or the way that we we've been a, a, um, the way that we've been attracted to other people. But what does he do is he purifies us and he gives us a strength, the strength to be able to live out a life that is, like the Catechism talks about, chaste chastity there are hundreds thousands of christians who experience same-sex attraction and yet have chosen to live lives of chastity 
sometimes God has, has taken away the homosexual attraction. Sometimes he's, he's reordered it. But in many times, he, he doesn't. And... And, you know, part of the Christian life is called bearing a cross and taking it to Calvary, dying on that cross, and being resurrected to share eternal life with Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of Christian teaching that concupiscence, that is, the inclination to sin, um, just is part of the fallen world. And even after um, somebody converts to Christ, even after somebody, you know, is baptized and grafted into the body of the Lord and is equipped with the full armor of God, that inclination to sin is still there. You're still going to be tempted. Yeah, even Christ himself was tempted. In the in desert. In all ways, as we are yet without sin. Yeah. And so, whether the temptation is sexual, and in this case, you know, it's to act on same-sex attraction in a sexual way, uh, it doesn't matter really what the sin is. You're going to be tempted with that. The inclination to do something contrary to the will of God is always going to be there until your dying day. Mm -hmm. um, and you just have to fight against it. And the thing is, there is no limit to the amount of grace and mercy that God has for you to fight the good fight of faith and to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, you are able to use your faculties and fight. It's hard. There's a lot of self-mortification and dying to what you want. But what you need, God has it for you. And will supply every need in Jesus Christ. So submit to the yoke of Jesus Christ because his his burden is easy, his yoke light. So, and this same principle doesn't just apply to homosexuals. Like it again, going back to the catechism. Even though it's you know not my defining the defining source, it is actually for Protestants out there. Reading the catechism is pretty good. Of course, we disagree on a lot of things that are pretty significant to Catholics and and that, but. A lot of it is is biblical. Um, homosexuality, the way that we treat homosexuality and the way that we have to react to, to same-sex attraction is the exact same way single people have to react towards their sexual urges. We are called to chastity. We are called to not give in to those. And whether that means whether giving in to pornography, which is a struggle for many men, myself included. Uh, many, yeah. Yeah, me too. And I mean, and I think a lot of clergy, both Protestant and Catholic, have can attest to that, that that's a big problem for many of the men in their parishes if they've not even struggled with it themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible to get past, you know, pornography, masturbation, um, any sexual sin, um, because it's not the will of God, but it is the will of God that you use, it, you know, you delve into the grace offered you and overcome it. Yeah, um, and God's God's strength is there for for us to overcome, and it and it doesn't matter if if you're uh, a eunuch by <laughs> by uh, lack of being able to find a mate, or if you're a eunuch because you've devoted yourself to God, like Jesus talks about. You're still commanded to a life of chastity, of holiness, of 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 uh, sanctity, where you live your lives ordered after the way that God has commanded. When God talks about, when Jesus Christ talks about marriage, when he's asked about marriage, he says, in the beginning, God created them male and female. He said, whatever man is, God has joined together, let no man separate. He didn't give the option for any other union outside of that. Nowhere in scripture do we find that union. And yes, there were unions like this in the ancient world. So it wasn't done, it wasn't said in ignorance. So that is, that is what church teaching is. It's not about hating homosexuals or, or thinking that people that are same-sex attracted are, are evil and dirty and nasty. It's, it's a matter of being faithful, but speaking the truth in love. And I, we had an episode about speaking the truth in love. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Go listen to that, by the way. But I think the thing is we have to stay true to the essentials. Stay faithful to the historic tradition and teaching of the Christian church. Um, if you're a Catholic, definitely look at the catechism. Look at the sacred scriptures. Um, they're pretty solid there. But what we cannot do is we can't be overcome by sentimentalism, um, which is to say, oh, well, you didn't really mean it, or, well, you know, God loves you, and so on. Because, wait, it's not a sin to tell somebody that God loves them, whether they be gay or heterosexual, whatever. It's not a sin to say God loves you. But the thing is, God loves all men, but he wills 
no one to be damned. He wills all to be saved, but he just forces no one. And he wants you to change. Jesus loves you as you are, but he doesn't want you to stay there. Mm -hmm. Especially if that means a sinful lifestyle before. Um, Jesus calls you to more. He calls you to sanctity. And will you answer that call? That's the whole meaning of our life. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if you're a Protestant, just one, one of the things to, to help in this culture is just, and we've said this time and time again on this podcast, reading the Bible and not just reading it and having some sort of knowledge and memorizing verses. Memorizing verses is great, but scripture memorization does not equate with knowledge of scripture. Just reading the Bible to where it's actually, it seeps into your very bones to where even if you can't remember an exact, the, the exact wording of the passage, you know exactly what it says and it, it is, it transforms your mind. I mean, we live in a wonderful age of Google and the internet. So if you even remember a phrase, you're going to be able to find the Bible verse. I mean, so... Yep. There's... Siri might not be able to find it for you, but Google, Google. Assistant will. Yeah, use the Google. Come on. <laughs> um, but speak the truth in love, and don't yield to sentimentalism. Um, mm -hmm. Our feelings are nice, but Jesus Christ calls us to more, and we shouldn't cheapen the message. Jesus calls you to more. And going off what you were saying about emotionalism, you know, I, I love my brother. I love him more. I, I can't even communicate in words how much I love and, and cherish my brother. And still, and we, we are so close. And I wish I could say, I, I, I sometimes wish I could change church teaching, but I can't. I can't change what the Bible says. Nothing can change that. My, my feelings on this, uh, my feelings towards my brothers and those other people that I know and, and care for that are homosexual, I, I, that can't impact what I believe about Christianity and what I believe about the church. Or it, can't, it doesn't change what the Bible says. No matter how much I want it to, it can't. We have to be rightly ordered by the word of God. All right, and I think that's where we're going to end our our podcast for today and uh nathaniel's gonna read a benediction from first peter all right so our benediction comes from first peter starting at chapter 5 verse 8 be sober and watch because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour whom resist ye strong in faith knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world but the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you and confirm you and establish you. To him be glory and empire forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can follow us on uh, online, on Facebook, on Twitter, at The Rowdy Hobbit. Mm -hmm. And that's Nathaniel. For me, it's at Elijah Aldrich. Pretty pretty simple and boring there. Um and our uh, actual Twitter handle for the podcast is a uh, capital C P walk into a bar. Okay. And uh, you know we don't have a whole lot of followers on there, but you know it is what it is. Follow us there too. We, you know, it, you're probably just more. I mean, follow us there, sure, but follow follow us personally. Yeah. That's it's for the best. Um. We're going to be getting SoundCloud up again soon, hopefully. Uh, but until then, you know, we're still on YouTube. I, I'm Elijah, and I'm a Protestant. And I'm Nathaniel, and I'm a Catholic. Until next time. <laughs>